Hello, Tom Levecki here with a very special edition of the New Theory Podcast. <clears throat> this is in conjunction with New Jersey Digest. Check out New Jersey Digest at the digestonline.com. I'll put a link below everything you need to know about New Jersey lifestyle. So today's guest will be joining us in a minute. Uh, Mark Lore, who is a successful entrepreneur, businessman, and a proven track record, which is second to none, e-commerce space, technology, and so forth. He's probably best known uh, for his sale of Jet.com uh, which he sold to Walmart for $3.3 billion in 2016, which was a New Jersey-based, Hoboken-based uh, company. Um, he worked at Walmart for a while. He stayed at Walmart as a president and CEO of Walmart's e-commerce from 2016 to 20, uh, 2021. Uh, prior to that, and kind of a lot of questions I'm going to be asking about, his venture in diapers.com, which was insane because he literally started diapers.com, obviously selling diapers, and they didn't want to sell it to him. Pampers, Huggies, and so forth. Um, just wasn't happening. Uh, he found a workaround. We're going to talk to him a little bit about that. And then lastly, his latest venture, which is Wonder. Um, out of, and if you're in New Jersey, you saw like the food trucks driving around, the food vans, and a new concept called Wonder we're going to be talking about. So I'm really, really excited uh, to present to you Mark Lore. So without further ado, uh, we're here with Mark Lore. So Mark, welcome to New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Um, yeah, great to be on the on the podcast. Okay, so tell us about your formative years and how you kind of got the bug and the uh, aspiration to get into entrepreneurship. Yeah, I think, you know, people say, is it something you learn or you're born with? I think I was born an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I remember couple things from my early years, like four years old um, in crayon, it said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it was, I want to be a farmer. And yeah. um, when my teacher asked, you know, why I said, because they grow stuff from nothing. So I always wanted to grow stuff, even, you know, as a little kid, you know, I, I did my first sort of like uh, startup, you know, as, as a little kid with the yeah. uh, Casper, the friendly ghost, you know, the projector on the wall and charging, you know, like a, a nickel to relatives that tell the, tell the cast with the ghost story. You know, I don't know if you remember those projectors, but like, you know, and then I did every business you could think of as a kid, nice. washing cars, mowing lawns, newspapers, baseball cards, ev everything. And, um, you know, but I, I didn't grow up with, with, with money, you know, grew up in Staten Island, New York. And yep. I was the first person to go to you know college and, and stuff. And so, um, there wasn't really this idea that you would go work for a startup or do a startup. I had to get a real job, you know, and that was working in the back office of a bank when I graduated <laughs> uh, college. Um, and I just basically, uh, you know, I was doing banking for about six, seven years. Yeah. And um, this was in the late 90s and just saw, you know, the startup scene exploding, you know. Yes. And so I just one day walked in my boss's office and said, hey, um, I, I'm not fulfilled, you know, doing this banking stuff. I yeah. need to become an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. he laughed, you know, and I said, didn't you just have a baby? I said, yeah. He's like, you must have a great idea. And, uh, I said, no, I don't, I don't have an idea yet, but I, um, I know I got to do this. So I'm going to quit. And he said, you're crazy. You're going to give up this incredible job and be an entrepreneur. Like you don't even know what you're going to do yet. And I said, I know I just, I have to go all in. I can't, I can't sort of like do this on the side. So um, it was kind of crazy, you know, back then yeah. now looking back on it, but um, I knew what I wanted to do. And um, that's, that's how it all started. And he turned out to actually be one of your early investors, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He was the first investor. He said, well, if you're crazy enough to do this, um, can I put 50 grand in <laughs> and, uh, and that was the first 50 grand. And then from there, we went on to get like 60 angel investors averaging about 75,000 per person. Wow. So it was like a, a hard way to get 5 million bucks. But yeah, but, um, yeah that was the first uh, 
first foray into entrepreneurship. So, so one of the things that people think about, you know, like, hey, I got to raise money. And, you know, it's kind of funny because I think it's easier to raise like five million than it is to raise 5,000, <laughs> you know, in a sense where, you know, if you have big dreams and big goals or yes, for micro amounts, people look at you funny. So with that being said, though, um, you heard no a lot. Can you kind of walk through the iterations of going through the 75 investors? I think you said you got 500 presentations to get that at 75. So you got to be used to hearing no. Can you kind of count yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, no, it was, it was literally, like you said, it was hundreds of, of presentations, um, many more no's than yeses. And uh, yeah, you it's something you learn very early on um, that you can't like second guess a no, you know, you, you can't spend a second on it. You know, it's like, okay, no, great. And you know, the, the best thing that you can get next to a yes is a no. The worst is like that in between, I don't know, you know, and you've spent a lot of time spinning your wheels with someone when ultimately, you know, they had no intention of ever investing. Right. So um, learn, learning that uh, with experience becomes, becomes really important. Exactly. All right. So you obviously started a company. You eventually, I think, exited to Tops. You were running Tops for a while. But like, I'm keenly interested in diapers.com. Obviously, you're talking about Wonder, but diapers.com, where, okay, you're selling diapers, which I understood it very early on what you were doing. And, and, you know, Huggies and Pampers are like, we're not selling to you. And they're kind of like, or they are, the Coke and Pepsi, if not more so. In the diaper space, so you can sell huggers and pep, uh, uh, huggies and uh, pampers on diapers.com directly. What the heck did you do there, Mark? And how did you get around? Yeah, so uh, yeah, we would go to uh, BJ's Wholesale Club. It's like Costco, <laughs> and uh, we would we would clean them out of all the diapers, but they wouldn't let us. Um, like they wouldn't load the pallets for us on the truck, so we literally had to buy palace of diapers where we had to check out like everybody else and put it on the shopping cart and walk out, pay with the credit card, walk out with another load. And it became impossible. Uh, so we, we sort of made a deal with the, with the manager yeah. that if we left them some diapers, they would load them on the truck for us yeah. because we would clear them out and they have no diapers and they would complain and we'd say, okay, if you want us to, you know, leave you some diapers, you got to yeah. load them on the truck. And so they yeah. did that. But then it got, you know, untenable, like five different BJ's wholesale clubs every day we were cleaning out. Um, um, and it was just a few people in the company at that point. Yeah. So we had to get these diapers direct. And um, we came up with the idea of, of taking all the diapers, not leaving them any. Um, and hoping that they would tell Procter and Gamble and and um, Kimberly Clark yeah. to basically sell us direct. Wow. And so we, it was very painful because we took all the diapers and yeah. the guy was like, "Hey, um, you know, we had a deal. You're going to leave us diapers and we're going to put them on the truck." Yeah. And we said, "Yeah, no, no, no deal anymore. We're, we're taking them all." And he said, "Okay, well then you're going out through the checkout." And so that was really <laughs> painful because now you're talking about like hundreds and hundreds of boxes of diapers that we uh, had to like run through the cashier. Thanks. Um, and it was a, it was a game of chicken of who, who would break who, first. Yeah. And uh, we told them, Hey, listen, if you really want us not to take all your diapers, just tell Procter and Gamble to sell us. And then yeah. you can have all the diapers you want. Yep. And it didn't take long. Um, it was, it was a very painful, it probably was like a week. Yeah. And they called Procter and Gamble and said, Hey, can you sell these guys diapers? Yeah. And so we got a call from Procter and Gamble and they said, Hey, this doesn't change how we feel about you and selling diapers online. We think it's a ridiculous idea. We don't want to sell you because we think you're not going to, you know, you're going to go out of business. But since BJ's has asked us to, um, fine, we'll sell you. And, uh, -huh. uh that was like sort of the big break because then we started getting full truckloads from Procter and Gamble and Kimberly Clark direct to our warehouse. It was, it, we couldn't have sustained it very, very long uh, more. Um, and then, you know, it's, what's funny is 10 years later um, with jet.com, we had the Procter and Gamble people in our office <laughs> and they were given a presentation and I peeked my head in 
And it. it was about how they thought that, um, you know, something like 50% of diapers were sold online and they thought it was going 100%. Why yeah. would anybody buy diapers in the store when they yeah. can get them delivered? <laughs> and I remember just going in there and nodding and laughing and saying, yeah. you know, 10 years ago, your colleagues, what they said to us, yeah. <laughs> they said that, you know, so it was just funny. But so, so you, you know, again, my understanding was you were building an ecosystem, loss leader. Hey, we'll sell you some wipes. We'll sell you some other stuff, but really building, kind of building out the tech, the e-commerce and building the community, which was huge value to obviously Amazon. And when Amazon, prior to buying out, they were kind of messing around with you too. They were undercutting it and trying to choke you out a little bit to make your margins <laughs> worse. So you either got to sell more at less, you know, to kind of, you know, keep it float or you got to keep cap raising, which you know is not easy, especially when you're kind of mid flight. Right. So what yep. did Amazon do? And tell us a little bit about the buyout. It was like 560 million, I believe. Yeah. 550 million. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. They cut the price of diapers by 30%, um, which is unheard of, you know, like yep. diapers are a loss leader. You can lose money on diapers, Correct. but they cut, they cut the price 30%. And, um, I think what they saw was it wasn't, it was costing them a lot of money. It wasn't really uh, impacting our business. We had incredibly loyal customers and um, we weren't growing as fast after that, but we're still growing. And that's when they said, all right, we got to, this is, this is a real formidable you know, threat here. And, and then they, they took us out. So I believe, cause I've been told I've been following you. And I believe, it, you know, all these memes are going around. They're all positive about you. The guy who got his revenge about, with Beth, Jeff Bezos, which we'll get to in a second. But you stayed on there for two years, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I was there for two years. Now, two years. Uh, yeah. And you're obviously a serial entrepreneur. So whether you have an earn off, whatever that was, that's obviously your business. But here's my question, though. There had to have been some things you had to learn and unpack uh, system-wise, process, et cetera to extract when, before you started jet, not, not intellectual properties, but what I'm saying is what was some of your biggest learnings working for Jeff Bezos for those two years? Yeah. I mean, I, I think just learning, you know, the entire business, we didn't have a third party business. It was all first party on, on diapers. Oh, you did first party logistics. Yeah. At diapers.com. We did it not only for diapers.com. We did it for all the other websites we created. We created a pet site called wag. Yeah. Uh, online uh, pharmacy called soap.com. We had a toy uh, site called, um, uh, I'm just I'm trying to blank that. <laughs> we, we, had, we had like 10 sites, costa.com. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Yo-Yo is a toy site. Yeah. That's so right. we had all these sites. We did all first party. We yeah. didn't have third party. I think what we really learned inside Amazon was the power of, of, of third party okay. and how, you know, having that first party relationship allowed you to then sell everything else be a third party, make a nice commission. So nice. that was that was a big learning. I think we saw the power of assortment, yeah. how much assortment drove, you know, customer loyalty and and uh, differentiation. So yeah, those some some big learnings. So then you start Jet at Hoboken, New Jersey, and it's wildly successful. You built a great team and gave it a bigger exit for three point three billion with Walmart. One question though, before I get into Jet, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Wonder before we wrap up. Wait, wait, is it true you used to take an Uber every day to work because you don't want to lose that time driving and productivity? Somebody who knows you told me that. And, yeah. and when I and the second they told me that about five years ago, I think I probably spent an extra 800 bucks on Uber since, but I got a lot <laughs> done and I want to thank you for that, Mark. So is that true? Is that true? That is definitely true. And I, I'm always looking for life hacks yeah. to make life simpler, yeah. to be able to have more time yeah to focus i think the the amount you can get done when you you know outsource you know the the more mundane tasks yep. and uh the less you worry about things that have gone wrong in the past and the less you worry about things that might go wrong in the future if you could just get rid of like thinking about the past thinking yep. about bad things in the future yep. and outsource you have like five times as much uh, stuff to get done. You know what I mean? So absolutely. All right. So obviously you sell jet to Walmart. You had that for a while. Now we're getting into which it will be your biggest venture of all, which is not a small uh, feat considering your previous exits. So uh, let's get into it. Why did you uh, start wonder.com? Let's go through that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, really just saw, you know, that customer, um, you know, habits were changing. People were cooking yeah. less, especially yeah. the younger generation. 
putting a premium um, on convenience. Yeah. And I just saw how, you know, DoorDash, Uber Eats, Grubhub, they were exploding. Like we're a yeah. hundred billion dollars in the U.S. in food delivery and yep. just felt like as a customer, it wasn't the, the sort of the, the, the 70 net promoter score like yeah. experience, right? It was long right. delivery times, cold food, um, high fees. It just felt like there was a, you know, next generation opportunity. Um, and that's where we sort of got the, the idea to completely vertically integrate and create the first and only uh, fully vertically integrated food delivery platform where all the restaurants on the platform yep. are owned by Wonder and yeah. cooked together in a single small kitchen with only three pieces of electric cooking equipment. Wow. So it, it was a lot of years of culinary R&D, you know, culinary engineering and food science to be able to cook incredible quality food across that many restaurants in a really small space. Um, without any hoods, without any gas, without any, you know, grease traps and things like that. It's, it's a very, um, it, we almost turned it into like a micro fulfillment center, but it's yeah. cooked food. Interesting. So, but interesting enough is you pivoted though, because I remember seeing the Wonder Vans, um, you had the chefs outside kind of cooking, it's kind of, you know, somewhat cooked, but the, they would cook outside fresh, bring it in, but then you pivoted away from that. What was your learning about kind of the previous model and where did you pick up on some efficiencies on the new model? Yeah, so I think the, the original thinking was you can't beat the experience of um, you know, delivering, then cooking, yeah. as opposed to cooking, then delivering. Right. Um, but it required us to make incredible investments in culinary engineering to be able to cook in the back of a Mercedes Sprinter van yeah. where the driver was the cook. Yeah. So there was only one person on the truck and you had to cook under 10 minutes. Yeah. You had one piece of electric equipment and it had to be great quality. So those constraints is what really forced us to to innovate and that innovation led to you know putting you know what'll be next year 40 restaurants inside of a 2800 square foot brick and mortar yeah. um and um i think the the learnings were you know we had we had gotten to unit economic positive on the trucks it was working customers yeah. loved it yeah. but we also tested a brick and mortar and by setting a really tight delivery radius of not yeah. more than six minutes in the city, yeah. we were able to replicate the same customer experience. Great food, oh, wow. fast, super hot. Um, and um, and then we also uh, were able to offer multi-restaurant ordering. So you could order from multiple restaurants in a single delivery, which yeah. is really unique. Um, and then we, we also uh, figured that the return on capital was a lot better yeah. relative to the trucks. And right. our ability to scale was a lot easier with the brick and mortar. We can go into urban, suburban, rural. It was challenging to find, believe it or not, parking lots to park yes. trucks overnight. Yep. Hard to do in the city, yep. hard to do in rural areas. So yeah. we have a much bigger TAM, much more scalable model, uh, much higher return on capital. And we are able to, to at least match, uh, if not you know, a better, the customer experience as well. So we, we think we're onto something big, like yep. it, it works, it's working. We'll have 10 locations next month in the tri-state area, and then we'll add another 20 to 25 next year in the tri-state area and, yes. and up from there. So we're very excited about the early results. I feel like, and you may comment this if you'd like, I feel like you kind of got your revenge on Jeff Bezos, and here's why. Not just because of the jet deal, <laughs> but the last mile is not only like the little, you know, cobblestone in his shoe it's like the cinder block attached to his leg even he's having the toughest time with the last mile but you actually are like you know what we're going to get rid of the trucks we're going to have you know it's easy to have three or four cars pull up it seems like with a little pivot you literally figured out that last mile granted it's in a food space but yeah. you figured out that last mile so did that feel good once you finally kind of figured that out versus you know the vans yeah, absolutely. And you know what? With the Blue Apron acquisition, yes. it's even uh, more powerful, the last mile, because we can combine on-demand last mile delivery with off-peak uh, hours. We can deliver the meal kits when the, the couriers are not delivering on-demand meals. So it fits you know, the network like a, like a glove and um, yeah, it becomes super super efficient way to deliver last mile products. So Love it. yeah, very excited about that. And for those who haven't heard of Wonder, put a link below. You get the Far Pizza, amazing, uh, Bobby Flay. Literally, my wife and I, we ordered uh, Wonder three times this week. She want, I want lime salt. She wants sushi. 
that fight is over. It comes <laughs> fresh. One, one, uh, price, uh, one price, easy out the door. So before I wrap up, just some kind of final questions. You raise obviously a lot of money, um, you know, for uh, Wonder and, you know, you have the track record and that kind of stuff. But what are some of the unique challenges maybe now that you're overcoming at Wonder that maybe you haven't faced before, even in your other ventures? Yeah, I mean, I, I think just the, the scale at which we're operating uh, and the, um, you know, the the ambition, I think, is, you know, with each business, it gets greater and with more ambition it becomes more challenging, you know, to to, you know, eventually have, you know, thousands of locations across the country in the time period that we want to do it is a big challenge. Yeah. I think anytime you're dealing with food, um, there's, you know, consistency that you need to maintain. Yes. Um, that's that's hard enough doing it with one restaurant chain, but you know, next next year we'll have created 40 different restaurant chains. And so you have the combination of 40 chains uh in one location, yeah. but then you have to produce and, and put out and build hundreds and then thousands of, of locations. So it's just the the sheer magnitude of the of the scale at which we're operating is super challenging. It's something, you know, definitely saw that scale at Walmart, but you had, you know, the, the, the company behind you, a well-capitalized company doing it in a startup world where you have, you know, little room for mistakes is, yep. is much more challenging. So two more questions, but one question for the last one. Um, you as an Italian American guy grew up, you know, mm -hmm. Staten Island, New Jersey. Um, I say it's like a double-edged sword on one end. A lot of Italians had their own business, but on the other end, like you're leaving a job that, you know, so where did being an Italian American guy from the area kind of help you in the startup world? And was there any part of that that maybe culturally was a little bit of a hindrance? No, it definitely wasn't. My, my dad, you know, he, he started selling vacuum cleaners door to door. He was, he was the quintessential, like, you know, figure out a way to make a buck guy, you know, and yeah, I yeah, watched yeah. him work a hundred hours a week, yeah. you know, just trying to make a buck and, and, and do stuff creative and work really hard and, you know, he wasn't afraid to fail. He failed a lot. I saw him yeah. fail. He bounced back. I think as an entrepreneur, that's the number one thing you need to be able to do after working hard is yeah. being able to bounce back from failure and not worry about failing and not second guess failure. You got to just just go, you know, and I think just seeing that growing up and, in, in, you know, in, um, in Staten Island with my dad really is what, you know, I think helped help groom me as an entrepreneur. Amazing. Final question. We could open the door. They could sit down and have dinner, for, with a nice wonder dinner, maybe a, a, a DeFaro pizza or something from wonder. But you could have one meal with anybody, walk through that door, dead or alive, and have a meal with that person. Who would it be and why? <laughs> I, uh, Benjamin Franklin. Um, wow, I like that one. Yeah, Benjamin Franklin. I, I've, um, I don't know, I just, I just found him – you know, fascinating in that he was an entrepreneur, um, but he was also, you know, an inventor. He, you know, was focused on his own personal like, core values. He, you know, um, was helping build America. He, you know, he was into the arts. He was, he just seemed to do a ton, get a ton done at a time where, you know, it, it took, you know, months to, you know, get anywhere, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I was really like, fascinated by him so I, I would probably say him i love it so um i think the best way to find you if somebody who wasn't catch up with these best linkedin these days i guess yeah link linkedin um that would be you know and you finally have an instagram finally yeah i know i did finally went there <laughs> i love it mark laura thank you so much mark laurie sorry thank you so much for being on the new theory podcast and uh, the best of luck and success and uh, me and our, our our whole team will be rooting for you. Uh, thank you, Tom. It was great to uh, talk to you. Take Bye care. Ciao, ciao.